everybody, welcome. Uh, today I want to talk about The Last Thing You Remember. Uh, that's the name of the first piece on In Defense of Daydreaming, which is the album that I released just a couple months ago. So the 10 pieces that are on In Defense of Daydreaming were all written in the course of about 12 or 13 months. And because it was eclectic, um, there were you know really different avenues to uh, to choose from and to offer different moods, different settings. So in this video, I want to talk about a few things. Uh, one is the composition itself, then the tracking of it, and uh, finally the mix. The approach I was taking was, this is a conversation between the guitar and the cello. So the guitar says this, so what does the cello say? And then when the cello says that, and how does the guitar respond? So there is a, a, a presentation of material, a departure from it, and then a return. And that is Western music. So even though I'm writing a through composed piece, I am really coming from a jazz perspective harmonically. So I did want to go through the score a little bit. The first idea itself is uh, the bottom part of that A minor chord is fifths. So that gets uh, introduced right away. Uh, immediately, slash chords, uh, G over a C, B flat over an E flat, and the cello comes in uh, with a little pickup that is also fifths. That whole Joe DiOrio idea of breaking up chords that can be found throughout the piece if you have the score in front of you where it says let ring on the for the guitar part that's just grabbing those chords and breaking them up another thing you'll see this at measure eight uh the uh the, the g over c the b flat over the e flat they've been moved up an octave uh as you get into uh this a section in measure 10 and throughout the piece you're going to get some of these spread voicings which is a B flat, an F, and a C, which is really just that fourth voicing uh, scrambled up a little bit. Measure 12, that, that, we hear this, uh, this staccato uh, eighth notes in the cello. That's an important rhythm throughout the piece, and that's one of the things that helps with the big finish at the end is that rhythm. Uh, at measure 13, um, we get what you might consider a repeat of the opening, but now in a key, a major third above. 32 to be the beginning of this uh, development section. 43, uh, the da, 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 which is a very rhythmic section where the guitar uh, begins to assume a more uh, traditional accompaniment role and the cello gets to have a more singing melody and in fact in the score it says dolce there this is one of my favorite parts of uh, the piece where the uh, cello is mimicking the rhythm that the guitar had had in that previous section at 77 we get into some of the melodic minor thinking about uh, a g being your um, being your uh, bass note or a G7 of some kind, and then you have an A flat melodic minor um, scale uh, over that. So that was uh, was fun to have a cello kind of be in that role that we, you know, at least that I uh, tend to reserve for uh, jazz purposes. So that section uh, pushes us to 90, where we hear da 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 da, and that's that important uh, staccato rhythm. And then at 93, we have a return of an A section. This time, however, it's starting a major third up, and then um, a couple measures later, drops back to its original key in the A minor. Then we get a uh, big finish in the last uh, few measures. That is taking the sixth from uh, the previous section and ending on our big da-da, da-da rhythm. To Quentin's uh, credit, I mean, I gave him a MIDI file that was kicked out from Sibelius. I knew that it would work uh, for this piece because this is a piece that requires a lot of precision rhythmically, and um, and to me, a real there's a real motor to it. There's not a not really a you know romantic era ebb and flow or anything to it. For my end, I really wanted to play 
with a, his cello work that was down. I wanted to be able to react to what I was hearing. And to my mind, you know, that's what good studio playing is. It's imagining you're hearing what's on that track for the first time, it's happening live, and you're reacting to it and you're bringing all your emotional life to it. I tracked a guitar with my Shure KSM32 and my Crown pencil mic. Um, this is not the guitar that I used. Uh, this guitar actually is featured on another piece on this album called To Whom It May Concern. And the reason I didn't use it was because there's some spots uh, where I need to get up high for some chords and this not having a cutaway uh, was not cutting it. One thing that's kind of interesting about playing this piece, while there are, I guess we could call them idioms of fourths, some fifths, some voicings that I've been accustomed to playing, there's a lot of melodic material that um, was kind of bespoke to the piece. I'm just using my ear and my sensibility to play the note, write the note that I think should uh, be in that spot, whether it's the cello or the guitar. When it comes to the guitar, that has often meant it's not a, a, a standard arpeggio, it's not a standard voicing, it's not a standard, you know, kind of melodic idea or enclosure or something like that. So it presents challenges to the fingers, whether, you know, all the patterns and things that we do to memorize to be able to play, all the scales, all the arpeggios, they don't come in into use in something like this, so it presents that kind of challenge. Not a whole lot to talk about in terms of mixing here. Usually I would track in a separate session and then bring those over into my template. But since there's only three tracks, it didn't make much sense to do that. So uh, I've got a uh, master bus here, the cello, and as mentioned, two guitar tracks, one with the Shure, one with the Crown. Um, the see the Crown is panned a uh, hundred. I experimented with different things and just felt like this gave the guitar uh, some width and it helped it compete with uh, just the natural bigness of the cello. Uh, pretty simple uh, reverbs uh, one and two um, and uh, a couple delays here uh, using the Pro R2 and trying to make these instruments sound like they're in the same room together. Just a little bit of automation in terms of volume for both the cello and the guitar, just to make sure that the right instrument is highlighted at the right time. Maybe the most surprising thing here is uh, the J37, which is the Abbey Road tape simulator. Just wanted to have some glue here and uh, warm the whole track up a little bit. Thanks for taking the time to check out this video. I hope you liked it. I would be honored if any cellist or guitarist wanted to play this piece. The score can be found at dougmattingly.com. In Defense of Daydreaming is on all platforms. All material for this video is linked in the description. Please like and subscribe, and we'll see you next video.